I stared at Nate's phone, my hands trembling. The message glared back at me, mocking everything I thought I knew about our marriage. Can't wait to see you tonight, babe? Same hotel as last time? My stomach churned. I heard Nate's footsteps on the stairs and quickly set the phone down exactly where I'd found it on the kitchen counter. Hey, honey, Nate said, breezing into the kitchen. He kissed my cheek, oblivious to the storm raging inside me. What's for dinner? I forced a smile. Just a salad. I'm not very hungry. Nate frowned. Everything okay? Actually, I said, my voice steadier than I felt. We need to talk. His eyes darted to his phone on the counter, then back to me. What's going on, Claire? I took a deep breath. I saw the message, Nate. Who is she? The color drained from his face. Claire, I can explain. Don't. I cut him off. Just tell me the truth. How long has this been going on? Nate slumped into a chair. A few months. He mumbled. The admission hit me like a physical blow. Months? I echoed. And you never thought to mention it? I didn't want to hurt you, he said weakly. I laughed, a harsh sound that surprised even me. Well, congratulations, you failed spectacularly. Just then our son Jamie's voice piped up from the doorway. Mommy? Daddy? Why are you yelling? I turned to see our four-year-old clutching his favorite stuffed elephant, his eyes wide with concern. Guilt washed over me. How could I have forgotten he was upstairs? It's okay, sweetie, I said, forcing a smile. Mommy and Daddy are just having a grown-up talk. Why don't you go play in your room for a bit? Jamie hesitated, then nodded, and trudged back upstairs. I turned back to Nate, my voice low and dangerous. We are far from done with this conversation, but right now, I need to not be around you. I grabbed my phone and car keys, ignoring Nate's protests as I stormed out of the house. I drove aimlessly for a while, trying to process the bomb that had just detonated in my life. Eventually, I found myself parked outside my mother's house. Ruth opened the door before I could even knock. One look at my face told her everything she needed to know. Oh, honey, she said, pulling me into a hug. Come in and tell me what happened. We settled on her worn floral couch, the same one I'd cried on as a teenager after my first heartbreak. Now, here I was again, my world crumbling around me. Nate's having an affair, I said, the words burning my throat. Ruth's face hardened. That son of a... She caught herself, taking a deep breath. How did you find out? I recounted the story, my mother's face growing stormier with each detail. What are you going to do? She asked when I finished. I shook my head. I don't know, I can't just leave. There's Jamie to think about and our whole life together. Ruth took my hands in hers. Claire, listen to me. You are strong, smart, and capable. You don't need a man who doesn't respect you. Whatever you decide, I'm here for you. Her words were like a lifeline, pulling me back from the edge of despair. Thanks, Mom, I whispered. Just then, my phone buzzed. A text from Nate, please come home, we need to talk. I showed it to Ruth, who scowled. You don't owe him anything right now. I know, I said, but I need answers, and I need to make sure Jamie's okay. Ruth nodded reluctantly. Call me if you need anything. And Claire? Her eyes met mine, fierce and protective. Don't let him manipulate you, you deserve better. As I drove home, my mind raced. What would I find when I got there? Could our marriage survive this betrayal? And most importantly, how could I protect Jamie from the fallout? I pulled into our driveway, stealing myself for the confrontation to come. Whatever happened next, I knew one thing for certain, nothing would ever be the same again. I walked into our house, my heart pounding. Nate was pacing in the living room, his face a mask of guilt and anxiety. Claire, I'm so sorry, he began. I held up a hand. Save it. I want the whole truth, Nate. No more lies. He nodded, sinking onto the couch. Her name is Veronica. She's from work. It started at a conference six months ago. Six months. Half a year of deception. I felt sick. Why? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper. Nate ran his hands through his hair. I don't know. Things between us have been different since Jamie was born. Veronica made me feel... Don't you dare, I snapped. Don't you dare blame our son or me for your choices. You're right, he said quickly. It's all on me. I'll end it, Claire. I promise. We can work through this. I laughed bitterly. You think it's that simple? That you can just say sorry and everything goes back to normal? No, of course not, Nate said. But we have a family. A life together. Don't throw that away. His words triggered a memory. Suddenly, I was transported back to our first date, ten years ago. 
Nate's boyish grin as he nervously asked me out for coffee. The way my heart fluttered when he took my hand. How did we get from there to here? Claire? Nate's voice snapped me back to the present. What are you thinking? I shook my head. I'm thinking about how different things used to be. Remember our first apartment? How we'd stay up all night talking about our dreams? Nate's eyes softened. Of course I do. Those were good times. What happened to us, Nate? He reached for my hand, but I pulled away. Life happened, I guess. Work, stress, raising Jamie. But we can get back to that, Claire. I know we can. I wanted to believe him. Part of me ached to forgive, to try and salvage what we once had. But the larger part, the part still reeling from his betrayal, couldn't let go so easily. I need time, I said finally, and space. I'm going to stay at my mom's for a while. Nate's face fell. Please don't go. We can figure this out together. I can't be here right now, Nate. I can't look at you without seeing her. As if on cue, Nate's phone buzzed. We both froze, staring at it. Answer it, I said coldly. Nate hesitated, then picked up the phone. His face paled as he read the message. It's her, isn't it? I asked, already knowing the answer. He nodded, looking miserable. Claire, I swear, I'll end it right now. I stood up. I'm going to pack some things for Jamie and me. When I come back down, I want you to have told her it's over, and I want to see the message. I climbed the stairs, my legs feeling like lead. In Jamie's room, I found him playing quietly with his toys. Hey, sweetie, I said, forcing a smile. How about we have a sleepover at Grandma's house? Jamie's face lit up. Really? Can we have ice cream? I laughed, the sound almost foreign to my ears. Of course we can. As I packed our bags, I heard Nate's muffled voice from downstairs. Was he really ending it? Or was this just another performance for my benefit? When I returned to the living room, Nate held out his phone. It's done, he said. Read it yourself. I took the phone, scanning the messages. Nate had indeed told Veronica it was over. Her response was a string of angry emojis followed by, This isn't the end of this, Nate. You'll regret this. A chill ran down my spine. What does she mean by that? Nate shrugged helplessly. I don't know. She's probably just upset. I handed back the phone, suddenly eager to leave. We'll be at my mom's. I'll let you know when I'm ready to talk more. As Jamie and I drove away, I couldn't shake the feeling that this was far from over. Veronica's threat echoed in my mind, and I wondered what other surprises Nate's betrayal would bring. A week had passed since I'd left Nate, and the gnawing doubt in my stomach wouldn't subside. Despite his promises, something felt off. I couldn't shake the feeling that he was still hiding something. You need to take care of yourself, Claire, Mom said over breakfast. You look exhausted. I managed a weak smile. I'm fine, Mom, just worried about Jamie. She squeezed my hand. That boy is resilient. He takes after his mother. As if on cue, Jamie bounded into the kitchen. Mommy, when are we going home? The question pierced my heart. Soon, sweetie. We're just having an extended vacation at Grandma's, remember? After dropping Jamie at preschool, I made a decision. I had to know the truth once and for all. I parked down the street from Nate's office, my heart racing. This was crazy, following my own husband like some kind of amateur detective. But I needed answers. Hours ticked by. Just as I was about to give up, Nate emerged from the building. He looked around furtively before hurrying to his car. I waited a moment, then followed at a safe distance. To my surprise, Nate didn't head home. Instead, he drove to an upscale hotel on the outskirts of town. My stomach churned as I watched him enter the lobby. I waited 15 agonizing minutes before following. At the reception desk, I put on my best smile. Hi, I'm supposed to meet my husband, Nate Sanford. Could you tell me which room he's in? The receptionist hesitated. I'm sorry, ma'am, but we can't give out that information. I leaned in, lowering my voice. Please, it's our anniversary. I wanted to surprise him. She glanced around, then whispered, Room 412. My hands shook as I rode the elevator. This was it, the moment of truth. I knocked on the door of 412, my heart pounding. Nate answered, his face draining of color when he saw me. Claire? What are you? I pushed past him into the room. It was empty, but I could smell perfume in the air. Where is she, Nate? Who? There's no one here, he stammered. I stormed into the bathroom, throwing open the shower curtain. Empty. But then I noticed the window was open, a slight breeze rustling the curtains. Did she climb out the window? I asked incredulously. We're on the fourth floor. Nate's shoulders sagged. 
Claire, I can explain. Save it, I spat. I've heard enough of your explanations. As I turned to leave, something caught my eye. A briefcase, partially hidden under the bed. I grabbed it before Nate could stop me. Claire, don't. I popped it open. Inside were stacks of cash and what looked like financial documents. What is this? I demanded. Nate's face was ashen. It's not what you think. Really? Because it looks like you're involved in something illegal. He reached for the briefcase, but I held it away. Claire, please, you don't understand. I'm in trouble. For a moment, I saw fear in his eyes. Real, genuine fear. Despite everything, a part of me wanted to comfort him, to help him out of whatever mess he'd gotten himself into. But then I remembered the lies, the betrayal, the shattered trust. You're right, Nate. I don't understand, I said coldly. And I'm done trying to. I turned to leave, briefcase in hand. Claire, wait! Nate called desperately. If you walk out that door with those documents, you'll be in danger too. I paused, my hand on the doorknob. What kind of danger? Nate's voice was barely above a whisper. The kind that doesn't forgive mistakes. A chill ran down my spine. What had Nate gotten mixed up in? And more importantly, how was I going to protect Jamie from whatever storm was coming? I looked back at Nate, seeing not the man I'd loved for years, but a stranger. I'll take my chances, I said, and walked out the door. As I drove away, my mind raced. I had evidence of Nate's affair and now, potentially, of criminal activity. But at what cost? What kind of danger had I just invited into our lives? One thing was certain. Nothing would ever be the same again. I clutched the briefcase tightly as I drove to my parents' house, my mind reeling. What had Nate gotten himself into? And more importantly, what was I going to do about it? Mom was waiting for me when I arrived, her face etched with concern. Claire, what's wrong? You look like you've seen a ghost. I collapsed into her arms, the weight of everything finally crashing down on me. Through tears, I told her about following Nate, the hotel room, and the mysterious briefcase. Oh, honey, she sighed, stroking my hair. What a mess. Just then, my phone buzzed. A text from Nate. Family dinner at my parents tonight. Please come. We need to talk. I showed Mom the message, my stomach churning. I can't face them, Mom. Not after everything that's happened. She squeezed my hand. You're stronger than you know, Claire, and you won't be alone. I'm coming with you. Hours later, we stood on Nate's parents' doorstep. I took a deep breath, stealing myself for what was to come. Miriam answered the door, her smile not quite reaching her eyes. Claire, darling, we've missed you. Her gaze flickered to Mom. Ruth, what a surprise. Mom's grip on my arm tightened. I'm here to support my daughter, Miriam. I'm sure you understand. The tension in the room was palpable as we sat down to dinner. Nate looked haggard, avoiding my eyes. His father, Walter, cleared his throat. So, Claire, when are you coming home? This little vacation of yours has gone on long enough, don't you think? I set down my fork, my appetite vanishing. It's not a vacation, Walter. Nate and I are separated. Miriam, Miriam gasped dramatically. Separated, but why? Every marriage has its rough patches, dear. You can't just give up. I didn't give up. I said, my voice shaking. Nate gave up when he decided to have an affair. The room fell silent. Nate's face paled. Claire, please. No, Nate. I cut him off. I'm done hiding the truth. Your parents deserve to know what kind of man their son really is. Miriam's eyes flashed. Now listen here, young lady. I won't have you speaking ill of my son in his own home. Whatever issues you two have, I'm sure it's just a misunderstanding. Something inside me snapped. Years of biting my tongue of trying to please this woman, came rushing to the surface. A misunderstanding? Is that what you call cheating on your wife and getting involved in illegal activities? The room erupted into chaos. Walter demanded explanations, Miriam hurled accusations, and Nate pleaded for everyone to calm down. Through it all, Mom stood by my side, a pillar of strength. Finally, I'd had enough. I stood up, my chair scraping loudly against the floor. I came here tonight hoping for honesty, for a chance to move forward, but I see now that was never going to happen. I turned to Nate, my voice steady despite the storm of emotions inside me. I know about the money, Nate. I know you're in trouble, but until you're ready to tell me the whole truth, we have nothing left to discuss. As I walked towards the door, Miriam's voice rang out. If you walk out that door, Claire, don't expect to be welcomed back. You made vows, for better or worse. I paused, my hand on the doorknob. Without turning around, I said, You're right, Miriam. 
I did make vows, but so did Nate, and he broke them long before I did. With that mom and I left, the sound of arguing fading behind us. As we drove away, I felt a strange mix of exhaustion and exhilaration. For the first time in years, I had stood up for myself, spoken my truth. I'm proud of you, Claire, Mom said softly. I managed a small smile. Thanks, Mom. But what do I do now? She patted my hand. Now, we figure out what's in that briefcase, and then, my dear, we fight. As we pulled into her driveway, I made a decision. No more hiding, no more playing the victim. Whatever Nate was involved in, whatever dangers lay ahead, I would face them head on. For myself, and for Jamie. The real battle was just beginning. The morning after the disastrous dinner with Nate's parents, I woke up with a sense of clarity I hadn't felt in months. It was time to take control of my life, for Jamie's sake and my own. Mom, I said over coffee, I need to move out, permanently. Ruth nodded, unsurprised. I think that's wise, honey. You know you and Jamie are welcome here as long as you need. I shook my head. Thanks, but I need to do this on my own. I can't keep hiding behind you. As I packed Jamie's things, my phone buzzed incessantly. Texts from Nate, voicemails from Miriam, even a message from Walter. I ignored them all. Just as I zipped up the last suitcase, there was a knock at the door. My heart sank when I saw Nate standing there looking haggard. Claire, please, he began, but I cut him off. No, Nate, I'm done listening to your excuses. He pushed past me into the house. You don't understand. I'm in trouble, real trouble. And now you've got that briefcase. Claire, you're in danger, too. I felt a chill run down my spine, but I stood my ground. What kind of trouble, Nate? What have you done? He ran his hands through his hair, his eyes darting around nervously. I... I got involved with some people. For the money. I thought I could handle it, but it spiraled out of control. What people? I demanded. I can't tell you that. It's not safe. He reached for my hand, but I pulled away. Claire, please, come home. We can figure this out together. For a moment, I wavered. The man before me looked so much like the Nate I'd fallen in love with years ago. But then I remembered the lies, the betrayal, the years of manipulation. No, I said firmly. I'm leaving, Nate. Jamie and I deserve better than this. His face hardened. You can't take my son away from me. Watch me, I shot back. Just then, Jamie came bounding down the stairs. Daddy! he cried, running into Nate's arms. My heart clenched as I watched them embrace. How could I separate a father from his son? But how could I stay with a man I no longer trusted? Nate looked at me over Jamie's head, his eyes pleading. One more chance, Claire, for Jamie's sake. I was about to respond when my phone buzzed again, a text from an unknown number. Meet me at Riverside Park in one hour. Come alone. I have information about your husband's activities. My mind raced. Could this be Veronica, Nate's mistress, or someone more sinister? Claire? Nate's voice snapped me back to reality. What are you going to do? I looked at Jamie, then at Nate, then down at my phone. In that moment, I made my decision. I'm leaving, I said, my voice stronger than I felt. Jamie's coming with me. When you're ready to tell me the whole truth, Nate, you know where to find me. Nate's face crumpled. Claire, please. No, I cut him off. I'm done being manipulated. I'm done being lied to. Whatever you're involved in, I want no part of it. I scooped up Jamie, who began to cry, reaching for his father. The sound tore at my heart, but I steeled myself. Mommy, why can't Daddy come? Jamie sobbed. It's complicated, sweetie, I murmured, shooting a glare at Nate. But I promise everything will be okay. As I loaded Jamie and our bags into the car, Nate stood on the porch, looking lost. Part of me wanted to run back to believe his promises one more time but I knew I couldn't. I started the engine, my resolve strength strengthening with each second. Whatever information this mysterious V had, whatever dangers lay ahead, I would face them on my own terms. As we drove away, Jamie sniffles quieting in the back seat, I glanced at the clock. Fifty minutes until the meeting at Riverside Park. Fifty minutes to decide whether to walk into what could be a trap, or to drive away and never look back. Either way, there was no turning back now. The life I had known was over. It was time to forge a new path, no matter how treacherous it might be. My heart raced as I pulled into Riverside Park. Jamie safely dropped off with Mom. The mysterious text from V had consumed my thoughts during the drive. Was I walking into a trap, or would this finally provide the answers I desperately needed? I spotted a lone figure on a bench overlooking the river. 
As I approached, I realized it was a woman, her face hidden beneath large sunglasses. Claire Sanford? She asked, her voice low and tense. I nodded, my throat suddenly dry. Are you V? She removed her sunglasses, revealing a face I recognized from company photos. Veronica Blake, Nate's colleague and mistress. We need to talk, she said, gesturing for me to sit. I hesitated, then sat down, keeping a wary distance. Why did you ask me here? Veronica reached into her bag and pulled out a thick manila envelope. Because you deserve to know the truth about your husband. All of it. With trembling hands, I opened the envelope. Inside were photos, documents, and what looked like financial statements. As I flipped through them, my stomach churned. There was Nate, shaking hands with men I didn't recognize, exchanging briefcases in shadowy parking lots. Financial records showing massive transfers to offshore accounts. And photos. Oh, God, the photos. Nate and Veronica in intimate embraces, yes, but also Nate with other women I didn't recognize. How long? I managed to choke out. The affair? Six months, Veronica replied, her voice bitter. The illegal activities? Much longer. I looked up at her, confusion and anger warring inside me. Why are you showing me this? Why now? Veronica's face hardened. Because Nate used me, just like he used you. I thought we had something special, but I was just another pawn in his game. And now, now I'm in danger too. A chill ran down my spine. What kind of danger? She leaned in close, her voice barely above a whisper. Nate's been embezzling money from the company, funneling it through fake accounts. But he got greedy, started working with some very dangerous people. When I found out and threatened to expose him, he... Her voice broke. He said he'd make sure I'd regret it if I ever told anyone. My mind reeled. The Nate I thought I knew, the man I'd married and had a child with, seemed like a stranger now. Why should I believe you? I asked, even as the evidence in my hands told its own damning story. Veronica's eyes met mine, filled with a mix of fear and determination. Because right now, you're the only person who can help me bring him down, and in doing so, protect yourself and your son. As if on cue, my phone buzzed. A text from an unknown number. We know you have the documents. Return them, or your family pays the price. I showed Veronica the message, watching the color drain from her face. They know, she whispered. Oh God, they know. Panic clawed at my throat. Who are they? What do we do? Veronica stood abruptly. We need to go. Now. It's not safe here. As we hurried towards the parking lot, I heard the screech of tires. A black SUV came to a stop in front of us, and two men in dark suits stepped out. Mrs. Samford, one of them said, his voice cold. We need you to come with us. Veronica grabbed my arm. Run, she hissed. We took off, sprinting through the park. I could hear heavy footsteps behind us, gaining ground. My lungs burned, and terror threatened to overwhelm me. All I could think about was Jamie, my sweet, innocent boy, who might be in danger because of his father's actions, because of the choices I'd made. As we reached my car, Veronica shoved me towards the driver's side. Go! I'll hold them off! But go! she screamed. Find Detective Morris at the 43rd Precinct. Tell him everything. He can help. With shaking hands, I started the car and peeled out of the parking lot. In my rearview mirror, I saw Veronica confronting the men, buying me precious seconds to escape. Tears streamed down my face as I drove, the envelope of damning evidence on the seat beside me. How had my life come to this? Running from shadowy threats, carrying secrets that could destroy everything I held dear. One thing was clear. There was no going back now. Whatever came next, I had to be ready to fight. For myself, for Jamie and for the truth that had been hidden for far too long. My hands shook as I gripped the steering wheel, speeding towards the 43rd precinct. Veronica's words echoed in my mind, Find Detective Morris. He can help. I prayed she was right, and that she was safe. As I pulled into the parking lot, my phone buzzed. A text from Mom. Where are you? Jamie's asking for you. Guilt and fear clashed in my chest. I needed to protect my son, but I also needed answers. I quickly texted back, Emergency errand. Be there soon. Love you both. Inside the precinct, chaos reigned. I approached the desk sergeant, my voice trembling. I need to speak with Detective Morris. It's urgent. He eyed me suspiciously. And you are? Claire Sanford? Please, it's about my husband, Nate Sanford. There's been a threat. The sergeant's eyes widened. Wait here, he said, disappearing into the back. Moments later, a tall man with graying hair approached. Mrs. Sanford? 
I'm Detective Morris, come with me. In his office, I spilled everything, the affair, the financial documents, the threats, and Veronica's involvement. Morris listened intently, his face growing grimmer with each revelation. Mrs. Sanford, he said when I finished, your husband is involved with some very dangerous people. We've been investigating this operation for months. My blood ran cold. What kind of operation? Money laundering, fraud, possibly worse. Your husband's company is just the tip of the iceberg. He leaned forward. We need your help to bring them down. Before I could respond, his phone rang. The color drained from his face as he listened. Understood, he said, hanging up. What is it? I asked, dread pooling in my stomach. There's been an incident at your mother's house, a break-in. The world tilted on its axis. Jamie, I whispered, terror gripping my heart. We need to move now, Morris said, grabbing his gun and badge. The drive to Mom's house was a blur. When we arrived, the street was lined with police cars, their lights painting the night in red and blue. I leapt from the car before it had fully stopped. Mom, I screamed, running towards the house. Jamie? An officer tried to stop me, but Morris waved him off. Inside, the house was a disaster. Furniture overturned, pictures shattered on the floor, and there, in the middle of the chaos, stood Nate, holding a terrified Jamie. Hello, Claire, he said, his voice eerily calm. I think it's time we had a family meeting, don't you? Let him go, Nate, I pleaded, my eyes locked on Jamie's tear-stained face. Nate's grip on Jamie tightened. You've really made a mess of things, haven't you? bringing the police into our private affairs. This isn't about us anymore, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. Think about Jamie. He needs his father. Something flickered in Nate's eyes. Regret, perhaps? But it was quickly replaced by steely resolve. He needs both of us, and we're going to walk out of here as a family. No one will stop us. Detective Morris appeared behind me, his gun drawn. It's over, Sanford. Let the boy go. Nate's eyes darted between us, desperation etched on his face. In that moment, I saw the man I once loved, scared, cornered, but still my son's father. Nate, I said softly, taking a step forward. Please, this isn't you. The man I married, the father Jamie adores, he's still in there. Don't let this be how our story ends. Time seemed to stand still. I could hear Jamie's quiet sobs, the crackle of police radios outside, my own heart pounding in my ears. Then slowly, Nate's grip on Jamie loosened. Our son broke free, running into my arms. I clutched him tightly, tears of relief streaming down my face. As the officers moved in to arrest Nate, he looked at me one last time. I'm sorry, he whispered, for everything. I watched as they led him away, a storm of emotions raging inside me. Anger, relief, sadness, and an overwhelming sense of uncertainty about what the future held. But as I held Jamie close, feeling his little heart beating against mine, I knew one thing for certain. Whatever came next, we would face it together. The worst was over. But our journey was far from finished. Six months after Nate's arrest, I stood in our new apartment, surrounded by half-unpacked boxes. Jamie's laughter drifted from his room, where he was playing with his grandmother. The sound warmed my heart, a reminder of the innocence we'd managed to preserve despite everything. Claire? Mom called. There's someone at the door for you. I opened the door to find Detective Morris, his face grave. Mrs. Sanford, we need to talk. My heart raced as I invited him in. What's wrong? Is it Nate? Morris sighed. I'm afraid so. He's made a deal with the prosecution. In exchange for a reduced sentence, he's agreed to testify against his associates. I sank onto the couch, emotions swirling. What does this mean for us? It means you and Jamie might be called to testify. And, he hesitated, there's a chance you could be targeted by the people Nate's turning on. The room spun. Just when I thought we were safe, just when we were starting to rebuild. What do we do? I whispered. We can offer you witness protection, Morris said gently. A new life, a new identity. I looked around the apartment at the life we'd just begun to create. The thought of leaving it all behind was overwhelming. Can I have some time to think about it? Morris nodded. Of course, but please be careful, and call me if you notice anything suspicious. After he left, I sank to the floor, tears streaming down my face. Mom found me there, wrapping me in her arms like she did when I was a child. Oh, sweetheart, she murmured. What are we going to do? I looked up at her, suddenly realizing the weight of my decision. It wasn't just about me anymore. It was about Jamie, about Mom, about the family we'd pieced together from the wreckage of my marriage. 
We're going to fight, I said, my voice stronger than I felt. We've come too far to run away now. The next few weeks were a whirlwind. I testified at Nate's trial, facing him across the courtroom with a strength I didn't know I possessed. I watched as the man I once loved was sentenced to years in prison, feeling not triumph, but a deep, aching sadness for what could have been. Through it all, my support system grew. Rachel, my best friend, became a constant presence, helping with Jamie and offering a shoulder to cry on. Kevin, mom's husband, stepped up as a father figure, teaching Jamie to ride a bike and attending his preschool events. And then there was Oliver. We met at a support group for divorced parents, his kind eyes and gentle humor a balm to my battered heart. Slowly, cautiously, we began to build something new. One evening, as we sat on the balcony watching the sunset, Oliver turned to me. Claire, I know you've been through hell, and I know you're still healing, but I want you to know, I'm here, for as long as you'll have me. I looked at him, this man who had seen me at my worst and still chose to stay, and for the first time in years I felt a flicker of hope for the future. I'd like that, I whispered, squeezing his hand. Later that night, as I tucked Jamie into bed, he asked the question I'd been dreading. Mommy, when is Daddy coming home? I sat on the edge of his bed, choosing my words carefully. Daddy made some mistakes, sweetie. He has to face the consequences. But he loves you very much, and so do I. Jamie nodded, his little face serious. Are we going to be okay? I pulled him close, breathing in the scent of his hair. Yes, my love. We're going to be more than okay. As I closed his door, I caught sight of myself in the hallway mirror. The woman staring back at me was different from the one who had discovered that fateful text message all those months ago. She was stronger, wiser, battle-scarred, but unbroken. I thought of Nate, of the life we'd shared and lost. I thought of Veronica, whose bravery had helped bring the truth to light. I thought of Mom, Rachel, Kevin, and Oliver the family I'd chosen, the support system that had carried me through the darkest times. And I realized that this, this messy, complicated, beautiful life was exactly where I was meant to be. Not running, not hiding, but standing tall, facing whatever came next with courage and grace. As I crawled into bed that night, I felt a sense of peace wash over me. The journey wasn't over, not by a long shot, but for the first time in a long time, I was excited to see where it would lead. The receipt falls from Heath's jacket pocket as I'm gathering laundry, landing face up on our bedroom floor. $400 for a single night at the Belmont Hotel. Last Tuesday, when he was supposed to be in Seattle for a sales conference. My hands shake as I pick up the paper, its crisp edges cutting into my fingertips. The date burns into my vision like a brand. I know that hotel. It's downtown, 20 minutes from our house. I hear Mason's video game sounds drifting up from the basement, the familiar beeping and explosions that usually fade into background noise. But now each sound feels like a needle under my skin. I fold the receipt carefully, tucking it into my back pocket. Hey, beautiful. Heath appears in the doorway, fresh from his shower. Water droplets still cling to his neck, and he's wearing that easy smile that used to make my heart skip. What's for dinner? I was thinking pasta. My voice comes out steady, surprising me. How was your morning meeting? Good, good. Closed that Phillips account finally. He starts rummaging through his dresser. Though honestly, these local clients are getting harder to land. Maybe I should focus more on out-of-state business. Like Seattle, I think, the receipt burning against my hip. Speaking of travel, how was that conference last week? You barely mentioned it. Heath pauses for just a fraction of a second before pulling out a shirt. Same old corporate stuff. Boring presentations, rubber chicken dinners. You know how it goes. I watch him button his shirt in the mirror, his fingers moving with practiced efficiency. Fifteen years of marriage, and I've seen this routine thousands of times. But now I'm noticing things. The new cologne he's wearing. The way he's been going to the gym more often. How his phone is always face down these days. Mom, Mason's voice carries up the stairs. Can Owen come over tomorrow? He got that new game we were talking about. We'll discuss it at dinner, honey. I call back, my eyes still fixed on Heath's reflection. Speaking of dinner, I should start the water boiling. In the kitchen, I mechanically gather ingredients, my mind racing. The Belmont Hotel. $400. 
A Tuesday night. Each detail feels like another piece of a puzzle I never wanted to solve. Heath comes down just as I'm draining the pasta, wrapping his arms around my waist from behind. His touch, once comforting, now makes my skin crawl. Smells amazing, he murmurs. I step away, busying myself with the sauce. Mason, dinner. We sit around our kitchen table, the one Heath and I picked out when we first moved in. Mason chatters about his game. Heath checks his phone between bites, and I push pasta around my plate, tasting nothing. Oh, by the way, Heath says, not looking up from his screen, I, I might need to head to Portland next week. Big potential client. The fork freezes halfway to my mouth. Portland. Another hotel. Another receipt. Another lie. I set the fork down carefully, studying my husband's face as he types something on his phone. There's a small smile playing at the corners of his mouth, one I've never seen before. Actually, I hear myself say, we should talk about your travel schedule. After dinner, Heath glances up, meeting my eyes for the first time since we sat down. Something flickers across his face. Uncertainty? Fear? Before that practice smile returns. Sure, honey, whatever you want. Mason looks between us, sensing the tension. I force a smile and ask him about his game, but my mind is already racing ahead, mapping out conversations and confrontations, planning moves and counter moves. The receipt feels heavy in my pocket, like the first stone in an avalanche that's about to begin. After sending Mason to school, I spend the morning digging through Heath's credit card statements. Each transaction feels like another betrayal, expensive restaurants I've never been to, boutique shops where the prices make me wince. The Belmont wasn't a one-time thing. My phone buzzes. Heath. Can't make it to Mason's game tonight. Client emergency. I type back. He's been practicing all week for this. Then delete it. Send instead. Okay. The doorbell rings, startling me. Through the peephole, I see a delivery man holding an elaborate flower arrangement. Not for me. The card reads Serafina, in flowing script. Wrong address, apparently. My fingers itch to open it, but I sign for the delivery and set it aside. Heath will have to deal with his own mistakes. At Mason's soccer game that evening, I spot a woman I've never seen before, standing at the far end of the field. Expensive clothes, perfect hair, watching our son with unusual interest. Something about her stance makes my stomach clench. Mom, Mason waves from the field. Did you see that save? I force a smile and cheer, but my eyes keep drifting back to the woman. She's gone before halftime. Great game, buddy. I tell Mason afterward, ruffling his hair. Ice cream? Can we wait for dad? He said he might make it for the second half. He got caught up at work. The lie tastes bitter. But hey, more Sunday toppings for us, right? At the ice cream shop, Mason picks at his dessert. Jake's parents got divorced last month, he says suddenly. He says his dad has a girlfriend now. The spoon freezes halfway to my mouth. That must be hard for Jake. Yeah. Mason swirls his ice cream into soup. His dad missed his birthday party. My phone lights up with a text from Heath. Running late. Don't wait up. Mom, Mason's voice is small. Are you and dad okay? Before I can answer, a laugh from outside the shop catches my attention. Through the window, I see Heath walking past with a woman, the same one from the soccer field. His hand rests on the small of her back, intimate and familiar. They haven't noticed us. Mom, Mason turns to look, but I grab his attention. Hey, want to try some of mine? The mint chip is really good. That night, after Mason's asleep, I hear Heath's key in the lock. He smells like expensive perfume and whiskey. You missed a great game. I say from the darkness of the living room. He jumps. Jesus, Lila. Why are you sitting in the dark? Serafina seems nice. The name drops like a stone between us. Does she like soccer? Heath's face hardens. Have you been following me? Didn't have to. She came to watch my son play. My voice stays steady, even as rage builds in my chest. Our son. It's not what you think. The flowers came here by mistake. I gesture to the arrangement. You might want to update her delivery address. He runs a hand through his hair, a nervous, 
tell I used to find endearing. Look, things haven't been great between us. Save it. I stand up. I've already called a lawyer, but we need to tell Mason together. He deserves that much. You're overreacting. We can work this out. Can we? Because I saw you tonight, Heath. The way you looked at her. I swallow hard. You never look at me like that anymore. The silence stretches between us, filled with 15 years of memories turning sour. Finally, Heath grabs his keys. I need some air. Of course you do. I head upstairs, pausing on the third step. By the way, Mason asked about Jake's parents getting divorced today. Funny timing, isn't it? I don't wait for his response. In our bedroom, I start packing a bag, my hands steady despite everything. The woman at the soccer field keeps appearing in my mind, watching my son, marking her territory. Well, two can play at that game. The Children's Hospital Foundation Gala wasn't where I expected to find Serafina Kane, but there she is, holding court near the champagne fountain. Her laugh carries across the ballroom, drawing attention like a magnet. My mother squeezes my arm. Breathe, honey, Evelyn whispers. Remember why we're here. Right. The hospital's new pediatric wing. The reason I spent three months organizing donor lists and seating charts. Not to watch my husband's mistress charm potential investors in a dress that probably costs more than my car. Lila Merrick? A tall man approaches, hand extended. Owen Lark. I'm heading up the architectural team for the new wing. I shake his hand, grateful for the distraction. The designs are incredible, especially the rooftop garden concept. Mom, Mason appears beside me, tugging at his tie. Can I go to the game room? They have the new. He stops mid-sentence, eyes fixed across the room. I follow his gaze to see Heath walking in, making a beeline for Serafina. My son's face crumples with confusion as he watches his father kiss her cheek. Mason, I start, but he's already moving through the crowd. I'll go, Evelyn says, following him. Owen shifts uncomfortably. I should probably stay, I say, surprising myself. Please. I could use a friendly face right now. Serafina spots me, whispering something to Heath. They approach, her arm linked through his like they're attending their own wedding. Lila, darling. Her voice drips honey. Heath mentioned you organized this lovely event. The Children's Hospital, such a worthy cause. Yes, well, some of us think about more than just ourselves. The words slip out before I can stop them. Heath's jaw tightens. Where's Mason? Probably wondering why his father is here with another woman instead of his family. Serafina laughs, the sound like breaking glass. Oh, Heath told me how bitter you've been about the separation. But really, darling, scenes like this don't help anyone. Separation. I look at Heath. Is that what you're calling it? Lila, not here. No, please tell me more about our separation. Tell me about the nights at the Belmont, the flowers, the restaurants. Tell me about showing up at our son's soccer game like some twisted audition for his new mother. Owen steps closer, his presence steady behind me. Serafina's eyes flick to him, something calculating in her gaze. Moving on already, Lila? How? Predictable. That's enough. Heath grabs her elbow. We're leaving. Why? I step forward. Stay. Explain to our donors how you're abandoning your family for someone who sees you as nothing more than a stepping stone to better business connections. Serafina's smile falters. You don't know anything about us. I know everything about you. The failed startups, the burned investors, the lawsuits. Did you tell Heath about those? Or just about the ones you won? The color drains from her face. Behind me, I hear Owen stifle a laugh. You're making a scene, Heath hisses. No, I'm making a point. Stay away from my son. Both of you. I turn to leave, but Serafina grabs my arm. He chose me, Lila. Accept it. Mom, Mason stands there, watching us, my mother behind him with tears in her eyes. The room seems to freeze. Heath steps forward, reaching for our son, but Mason backs away. I want to go home, he says quietly. I walk to him, wrapping an arm around his shoulders. He's shaking. Of course, honey, we can go. As we leave, 
I hear Serafina's voice. Heath, aren't you going to? But we're already moving through the crowd, my mother and Owen flanking us like guards. Outside, the night air hits my face, and I realize I'm shaking too. Not from fear or sadness, but from something else. Something that feels dangerously like power. Mom? Mason looks up at me. Are we okay? I pull him closer, catching Owen's concerned glance, feeling my mother's hand on my back. We will be, I promise. We will be. Mason's phone buzzes for the third time during dinner. He glances at it, then quickly turns it face down. No phones at the table. I remind him, but something in his expression makes me pause. Everything okay? Fine. He pushes his poster around. Can I go to Dad's this weekend? He's taking me to that new water park. The water park we'd planned to visit together next month. I thought we were going to. Serafina got VIP passes. He says her name casually, like he's known her forever. She says they have this awesome new slide that. The fork slips from my hand, clattering against the plate. You've been talking to Serafina? Mason's face closes off. She's nice, Mom. She helps me with math homework sometimes when I'm at Dad's. The room tilts sideways. Math homework. While I've been working late, trying to keep our lives stable, she's been playing tutor to my son. How long has this been happening? He shrugs, reaching for his phone again. It lights up with another message. Mason. My voice sharpens. Show me the phone. You can't tell me who to talk to. He clutches it to his chest. Dad says you're just jealous because Serafina is successful and you're stuck in the same boring job. The words hit like a slap. Before I can respond, the doorbell rings. Owen stands on the porch, holding a folder. Sorry to drop by unannounced, but I found something about Serafina you should see. Mason bolts upstairs, his door slamming as Owen spreads documents across my kitchen table. Business records, court filings, news clippings. She's done this before. Owen explains. Find successful men, usually married, uses their connections to boost her businesses, then leaves them bankrupt when things go south. My eyes catch on a photo, Serafina, with another family, another child. These are from three years ago. Different city, different name. Owen taps the article. The kid was 12 too. A text lights at my phone. Heath asking for Mason's shoe size. For water park sandals, probably. I imagine Serafina shopping with them, playing happy families with my son. Mom, Mason appears in the doorway, backpack in hand. Dad's here to pick me up. Through the window, I see Heath's car idling in the driveway. Serafina sits in the passenger seat. Mason, wait. But he's already moving past me. Let him go, Owen says quietly. We need to be smart about this. I watch through the window as my son climbs into the back seat. Serafina turns, saying something that makes him laugh. The same laugh he used to share with me over inside jokes and silly stories. She's not just taking my husband. I realize. She's taking my whole life. Owen gathers the documents. There's more. Her company's in trouble again. Major investors pulling out. Heath doesn't know it yet, but he's about to lose everything. Including Mason. I turn from the window. Unless we stop her first. Lila. Owen's voice is careful. What are you thinking? I pick up one of the articles, studying Serafina's previous victim, a man who lost his business, his home, his family. I'm thinking it's time to make some calls. Starting with her former investors. That could get messy. She's poisoning my son against me. My hands shake as I gather the papers. Messy doesn't scare me anymore. Owen watches me, concern mixing with something else in his expression. Just be careful. Don't let revenge cost you what you're trying to protect. But as I look at the empty chair where Mason should be sitting, at his half-eaten dinner growing cold, I realize some costs are already too high. Serafina, Kane isn't just playing games with my family, she's declaring war. And I'm done playing defense. The email from Serafina's former business partner arrives at 3 a.m. I've been awake anyway, scrolling through Mason's social media, watching my son's life unfold in photos where I don't exist. Serafina teaching him to ski. Heath and Mason at expensive restaurants. The perfect little family she's building on the ruins of mine. 
She'll destroy everything, the email warns. Not just the money, the relationships, the trust, everything. Get out while you can. My phone rings, startling me. Mason. Mom. His voice sounds small, younger than 12. Can you come get me? I'm already grabbing my keys. What's wrong? They're fighting. Really bad. About money, I think. Dad threw something and... A crash in the background. Please. I break every speed limit getting to Heath's new condo. Mason's waiting outside, huddled on the steps in his pajamas. Through the open window above, I hear Serafina's voice, sharp as broken glass. You promised me that investment would come through. Do you know how much I've lost because of you? Mason climbs into my car, clutching his backpack. Can I stay with you tonight? Of course, honey. I resist the urge to speed away, to protect him from whatever's unfolding upstairs. Want to talk about it? He shakes his head then. Serafina's different now. She gets mad a lot. Dad, too. At home, I make hot chocolate while Mason settles on the couch. His phone keeps lighting up with texts from Heath, from Serafina. He ignores them. Remember when we used to do this? He wraps his hands around the mug. When I couldn't sleep? Every thunderstorm. I sit beside him, careful to leave space. You'd count the seconds between lightning and thunder. Serafina says that's baby stuff. He stares into his chocolate. She says I need to grow up faster. The familiar rage rises, but before I can respond, my phone buzzes. Owen. Her company's imploding. His text reads, Board meeting tomorrow. You should be there. Mason's phone lights up again. Heath calling now. He lets it ring. They were talking about selling the lake house, he says quietly. Dad signed something for her business, and now. The lake house. Where Mason learned to swim. Where we spent every summer. Where Heath proposed. That's not going to happen. The words come out harder than intended. How do you know? Because I've spent weeks building a case against her. Because Owen's contacts at the investment board are ready to expose her pattern of fraud. Because tomorrow, her carefully constructed world will shatter. But looking at Mason's tired face, I realize revenge won't heal what's broken here. Mom, he shifts closer, like he used to during thunderstorms. I'm sorry I said those things before. About you being jealous and boring. It's okay, honey. No, it's not. His voice cracks. She made it sound so cool at first. Like we'd be this amazing new family. But now dad's always angry, and she keeps talking about sending me to boarding school, and I just want. He stops, shoulders shaking. I pull him close, feeling his tears soak my shirt. My phone buzzes again. Owen sent the board meeting details, the evidence we've gathered. Everything needed to destroy Serafina came tomorrow. But Mason's breathing is evening out, his body heavy with sleep, trusting me to keep him safe. Like I used to. Like I always should have. I text Owen back. Need to handle this differently. For Mason. His response is immediate. Whatever you need. I'm here. Outside. Thunder rumbles. Mason stirs but doesn't wake. I start counting seconds automatically, a habit from all those stormy nights, realizing some patterns are worth keeping, and some cycles of hurt need to end, not with revenge, but with repair. Tomorrow will come with its own storms. But tonight I hold my son and plan a different kind of justice, one that might actually heal what's broken. The lake house looks smaller somehow, its windows dark against the setting sun. Mason's old tire swing hangs motionless as Heath signs away 15 years of memories to cover Serafina's debts. You don't have to do this, I tell him, watching him initial each page without reading. We can find another way. There is no other way. His hand shakes slightly. She just needs time to sort out the business. Once the new investors. There are no new investors, Heath. I slide Owen's report across the table. She's done this before. Multiple times. He pushes the papers back without looking. You're just trying to poison everything good in my life. Like always. Dad. Mason appears in the doorway, clutching his old fishing rod. Can we go out on the lake one last time? Before. Sorry, buddy. Serafina's waiting at the lawyer's office. Heath stands, gathering the sale documents. Maybe next summer we can. 
There won't be a next summer here. Mason's voice cracks. You're selling everything for her, just like the college fund. Heath freezes. Who told you about that? I heard you fighting. Mason's knuckles whiten around the fishing rod. You said you had to borrow from my account because her business needed cash. You promised you'd pay it back. The room goes still. I look at Heath, really look at him, seeing the new lines around his eyes, the expensive watch that can't hide his trembling hands. Mason, go wait in the car. I say quietly. No. He hurls the fishing rod across the room. I hate this. I hate her. And I hate you for letting her ruin everything. He storms out, screen door slamming behind him. Through the window, I watch him run down to the dock where he learned to fish, where Heath taught him to swim, where our family used to be whole. His college fund? My voice sounds distant cold. Really, Heath? It's temporary. Once the deal closes. There is no deal. I pull out my phone, showing him the email from Serafina's former partner. She's already moved most of the money offshore. By tomorrow, she'll be gone. Just like last time. And the time before that. You're lying. But his face has gone pale. She loves me. She loves Mason. She loves what you can give her. And now that's gone too. His phone buzzes Serafina, demanding to know where he is. He stares at the screen, then at the lake house papers, then through the window at Mason. I can't lose her, he whispers. You already lost everything else. He leaves without another word, sail documents clutched to his chest like a shield. I watch him drive away, wondering how the man I loved for 15 years became this stranger who would sacrifice his son's future for a con artist's lies. My phone rings, Owen. The board meeting's starting, he says. Serafina's there. If you want to stop this. It's too late. I watch Mason on the dock, his shoulders shaking. He gave her Mason's college fund. Silence on the line. Then, I'll have my lawyer draw up emergency custody papers. With a financial fraud evidence. No. I think of Mason's face when he threw the fishing rod. All that hurt and betrayal. More legal battles won't heal that. I need to try something else first. Lila. Trust me. I hang up and walk down to the dock, sitting beside Mason. The lake stretches before us, reflecting the dying sun like shattered glass. Remember when you were six, I say softly, and you fell off the stock? You were so scared, but you knew how to swim. You just needed to remember you were strong enough. He wipes his eyes with his sleeve. What do we do now, Mom? I pull him close, feeling his heart race against mine. We remember we're strong enough. Behind us, the tire swing moves slightly in the breeze, casting a shadow that looks almost like a noose. The investment board meeting erupts into chaos when I walk in with Mason. Serafina's perfectly composed face cracks for just a second before her smile returns. Lila, darling, this is a private meeting. Her voice carries that familiar honey-sweet tone. And Mason should be in school. He needs to hear this. I guide Mason to a seat, noting how Heath won't meet either of our eyes. Everyone does. The board members shift uncomfortably as I connect my laptop to the projector. Serafina's previous victims appear on screen, the ex-husband in Seattle, the business partner in Chicago, the family in Boston. All their stories, their losses, their shattered lives. This is harassment, Serafina stands, smoothing her designer dress. Heath, tell them. About my college fund? Mason's voice cuts through the room. Or about the lake house? Heath flinches like he's been struck. Serafina's smile doesn't waver but her hands betray her, crushing the paper cup she's holding. Mason, sweetie, those are temporary arrangements. Once the new funding comes through, there is no new funding. I pull up the offshore account transfers, just like there wasn't any in Seattle, or Chicago, or Boston. It's the same pattern, isn't it? Find a successful man, preferably married with children. Isolate him from his family. Drain his assets. Move on. The board members lean forward, murmuring as they study the evidence. Serafina's lawyer whispers urgently in her ear, This is ridiculous. She laughs, but it sounds hollow. Heath, tell them about our plans. 
the expansion, the merger. The merger that fell through last week? Owen steps into the room, holding more documents. Or, the one that never existed? Heath stands suddenly, knocking over his chair. You said those deals were confirmed. You said. She says a lot of things, Dad. Mason's voice trembles slightly. Like how you'd buy back the lake house. Like how we'd be a better family. Serafina's smile finally cracks. You ungrateful little. Don't. My voice could freeze hell. Don't you dare speak to my son. She turns to Heath, reaching for his hand. Baby, they're trying to turn you against me. After everything we've built. Built. I project the final document, Heath's empty bank accounts, the drained college fund, the mortgaged house. You haven't built anything. You've destroyed everything he had. Everything we had. The board chairman clears his throat. M.S. Kane, in light of these allegations. Allegations. She laughs again, higher this time, desperate. This is just a bitter ex-wife's revenge fantasy. Heath, tell them. But Heath is staring at the numbers on screen, at the proof of his son's stolen future. Something breaks in his expression. The lake house was my grandfather's, he whispers. Mason learned to swim there. Serafina's mask shatters completely. She grabs her purse, heading for the door. But security blocks her path. This isn't over, she hisses at me. You think you've won? You've got nothing but a broken family and a kid who'll hate you both. No. Mason stands, walking to my side. I know exactly who broke our family. And it wasn't mom. The security guards lead Serafina away as she shrieks about lawyers and lawsuits. The board members file out, leaving just our fractured family and Owen. Heath approaches slowly, like a man walking to his execution. Mason, I'm so sorry. I thought. I know what you thought. Mason's voice is older somehow harder. But mom never stopped fighting for me. Even when I was awful to her. Even when I believed Serafina's lies. He turns to me, and for a moment I see my little boy again, the one who needed me to check for monsters under his bed. Can we go home now? I nod, taking his hand. Heath starts to speak, but Owen steps between us. I think you've done enough, he says quietly. We leave Heath standing there, surrounded by the wreckage of his choices. Outside, the sun breaks through the clouds, and Mason squeezes my hand. You okay? I ask. He considers this. No. But we will be. Six months later, I stand in the kitchen of our new house, watching Mason and Owen argue good-naturedly over pancake toppings. The morning sun streams through windows that face east, my one non-negotiable requirement when house hunting. Blueberries are clearly superior, Owen insists, sliding a plate across the counter. That's because you're old, Mason retorts, drowning his stack in maple syrup. Mom, tell him chocolate chips are better. I laugh, the sound easier now than it used to be. I'm staying neutral in this war. The doorbell rings. Through the window, I see Heath's car in the driveway. Mason tenses slightly, but keeps eating. I can get it, Owen offers. No, I've got this. I squeeze his shoulder as I pass. Heath looks older on the porch, more grounded somehow. The designer clothes are gone, replaced by familiar worn jeans and a work shirt. He holds up a fishing rod, Mason's old one from the lake house. Found this while cleaning out the storage unit, he says. Thought he might want it back. Through the window behind me, I hear Mason laugh at something Owen said. Heath's eyes drift toward the sound, then back to me. He seems happy. He is. Most days. I take the fishing rod. The therapy's helping. Both of us, actually. Heath nods, shifts his weight. I, uh, got a job offer. In Seattle. He rushes on before I can respond. I'm not taking it. I won't leave him again. I just wanted you to know I had the choice this time. And I'm choosing him. Good. The word comes out softer than intended. Serafina's sentencing is next week, he says quietly. I know. Are you going? I think about the folder of evidence in my office, the hours spent helping prosecutors track her pattern of destruction. No. I'm done looking backward. He starts to say something else, but Mason appears behind me. Is that my old rod? 
Heath's face lights up. Yeah, buddy. Thought maybe. If you want, we could fix it up. The real needs work, but... Mom and Owen are taking me fishing next weekend, Mason says. At the state park. Maybe. Maybe you could come? If Mom says it's okay. I feel the weight of their gazes. My son's hopeful. My ex-husband's careful. Through the kitchen window, I see Owen pretending not to watch, giving us space while staying close enough if needed. One day at a time, I tell them both. Mason takes the rod, studies it. The handle's loose. Owen has tools in the garage. Want to see? Heath follows Mason around the house, their voices fading as they discuss fishing knots and lure types. I return to the kitchen, where Owen's cleaning up breakfast. You okay? He asks. Actually, yes. I lean against the counter, watching father and son through the garage window. You know what Mason told me yesterday? He's been saving his allowance. Says he wants to help buy back the lake house someday. Owen raises an eyebrow. Really? Not for Heath. For us. All of us. I smile at his surprised expression. His words, not mine. Smart kid. Yeah. I watch Mason demonstrate something with a fishing rod, Heath nodding intently. He gets it from his mom. Owen laughs, pulling me close. Through the window, I see Mason smile, really smile, at something Heath says. It's not perfect, this new reality we're building. There are still hard days, therapy sessions, moments when the past threatens to overwhelm us. But here in this kitchen, with the morning sun warming my face and the sound of my son's laughter drifting in from the garage, I realize something. Sometimes the best revenge isn't about destroying what hurt you. Sometimes it's about building something stronger from the ruins. Mom, Mason calls. Come look at this. I go to them, stepping into the future one day at a time, leaving the shadows of the past where they belong, behind us. It was an ordinary holiday morning, the kind where the sun seemed to promise a day of leisure and laughter. I was in the hallway, coaxing my son Aaron to hurry up for his baseball game, when the world as I knew it shattered. Opening the door, I froze. There, like a ghost from a past life, stood Mark, my husband who had vanished without a trace three years ago. This is our home, he declared, his voice a strange mixture of assertiveness and uncertainty. But before I could process his presence, another figure emerged from behind him. Clara, my sister-in-law. The sight of her stirred a nest of vipers in my stomach. We're going to take custody of Aaron, Clara said, her voice dripping with a sickly sweetness. I remembered all too well. How many times had I speculated about this very scenario? Mark and Clara disappearing around the same time couldn't just be a coincidence. But with the whirlwind of daily life and limited resources, I had never been able to dig deeper into their disappearance. Lost in these thoughts, I barely registered Aaron's voice behind me. Hey, Mom, who are you talking to? My heart clenched. He stood there, my brave little boy, unaware, unaware of the storm about to break. Clara turned her predatory smile towards him. Oh, it's nice to finally meet you. You're Aaron, right? I've wanted to meet you for so long. Her voice churned my insides. That same voice that had charmed everyone around her, masking the manipulative, cruel nature I knew too well. The voice I had hoped to never hear again. Aaron, confused, glanced at me and then back at them. Dad, what are you doing here? And who is she? He moved closer to me, instinctively sensing the tension. Mark and Clara stood there, gaping like fish out of water, clearly not expecting this confrontation. Before they could recover, Aaron continued, his voice tinged with anger. We're about to leave. Move. It was then that Mark and Clara noticed something behind me, their faces drained of color. I couldn't help but let out a bitter laugh. Standing there was my daughter, Elise, cradled in Aaron's arms. Mark's eyes widened in shock, his gaze flicking between Elise and me. Mark, Clara... I started, my voice steady despite the chaos in my heart. Three years ago, you left without a word. I was left alone to pick up the pieces, to raise Aaron, and to face an unexpected pregnancy. I paused, letting the weight of my words sink in. Clara's eyes narrowed, but I continued. I'm not the same person you abandoned. I fought hard to build a life for my children and me, and I won't let you waltz back in to destroy that. Their faces were a picture of shock, disbelief, and, for a fleeting moment, guilt. But it was too late for guilt. The wounds they had inflicted ran too deep. 
Please leave, I said firmly. You have no right to be here. Mark opened his mouth, likely to spout some excuse or plea, but I didn't want to hear it. I closed the door on them, on the past they represented. Turning back to my children, I saw Aaron looking at me with newfound respect and Elise gurgling, blissfully unaware of the storm that had just passed. I took a deep breath, steadying my racing heart. This was just the beginning. The battle lines were drawn, and I was ready to fight for my family's future. The days following Mark and Clara's unwelcome visit were a whirlwind of emotions and memories, a tidal wave that threatened to drown me. I found myself revisiting the dark days after Mark's disappearance, the sleepless nights filled with worry, and the countless hours I spent questioning what I could have done differently. Aaron had struggled the most. Once a cheerful and outgoing boy, he became sullen and withdrawn, his bright eyes dimming. I remembered the countless dinners he pushed away, the school events he begged me to skip, and the cold, distant looks that replaced his warm smiles. It tore at my heart, but I couldn't find a way to reach him. As I brooded over these memories, Elise's innocent laughter echoed through the house, a stark contrast to the storm raging within me. She was my unexpected blessing, a light in the darkness of Mark's betrayal. Her birth had been a turning point for me, a moment of profound strength and vulnerability. One evening, as I tucked Aaron into bed, he turned to me with serious eyes. Mom, why did Dad leave us? Did we do something wrong? His question hit me like a physical blow. No, honey, you did nothing wrong. Sometimes adults make choices that don't make sense, and it's not because of anything you did. But why did he come back, and with Aunt Clara? The confusion in his voice was heartbreaking. I sighed, searching for the right words. I don't know why they came back, but I do know that we are a family, you, me, and Elise. We'll get through this together. He nodded slowly, his young face etched with worries no child should bear. I trust you, Mom. I just wish things were like before. I kissed his forehead, whispering, I know, my love. I wish that, too. The next day, I was jolted out of my reverie by a call from my lawyer, Mr. Thompson. Lauren, we need to discuss your legal options. Mark and Clara's claim is baseless, but we should prepare a case. I listened, my mind racing. This was my chance to fight back, to ensure that Mark and Clara couldn't hurt us anymore. Let's do it, I said firmly. I want to protect my children, and I won't let them be used as pawns in whatever game Mark and Clara are playing. Mr. Thompson's voice was reassuring. You're making the right decision. I'll start preparing the documents. We'll show them that they can't just walk over you. As I hung up, a sense of determination settled over me. Mark and Clara had underestimated me, thinking I would crumble under their pressure. But they were wrong. I was stronger now, tempered by the trials I had faced. I looked at Aaron, playing with Elise, and knew that I would do whatever it took to keep them safe. This was no longer just about revenge. It was about justice for my children and me. Mark and Clara had awakened a fierce protectiveness in me, and I was ready to fight back with everything I had. As the days turned into weeks, my resolve hardened like steel. I was prepared for the legal battle ahead, but nothing could have prepared me for the emotional warfare that ensued. Mark and Clara, like vultures circling their prey, began their campaign to wear me down. One afternoon, as I collected Aaron from school, I found them waiting, their presence a dark cloud on the sunny day. Clara's voice was sickeningly sweet as she called out to Aaron, Hi, sweetie, we've missed you so much. Aaron clung to my hand, his body tense. Why are you here? he asked, his voice barely above a whisper. Mark stepped forward, his expression one of feigned concern. We just wanted to see you, son. We're your family, too, you know. I felt a surge of anger. You lost the right to call yourself his family when you abandoned him, I snapped, pulling Aaron closer. Clara's eyes narrowed, her facade slipping. Lauren, you can't keep him from us. We have rights. Rights? You have no rights here, I retorted, my voice cold. You both made your choice three years ago. Now live with it. Mark's face twisted in anger. You think you're so perfect, Lauren? You're just a bitter woman who couldn't keep her husband happy. I could feel Aaron's grip tighten on my hand, his small body shaking. Let's go, Aaron, I said, turning to leave. But Clara wasn't done. You'll regret this, Lauren. We'll get what we want. We always do. Their threats echoed in my ears as we walked away. But I wouldn't let them see my fear. 
I had to be strong for Aaron and Elise. That night as I lay in bed, their words haunted me. The idea of losing Aaron to those two was unbearable. I couldn't let it happen. I had to be smarter, stronger. The next day I met with Mr. Thompson, my determination like a shield around me. I want full custody of Aaron, and I want Mark and Clara to have no visitation rights, I said firmly. Mr. Thompson nodded. It's going to be a tough battle, but I believe we can win this. You're a good mother, Lauren. The court will see that. As the legal preparations progressed, I found an unexpected ally in my own home. Aaron. One evening he came to me, his young face set in a serious expression. Mom, I want to tell the judge that I want to stay with you. Dad and Aunt Clara, they're not my family. Not really. Tears welled in my eyes as I hugged him tightly. Thank you, Aaron. That means more to me than you'll ever know. The day of the court hearing arrived like a storm on the horizon. I walked into the courtroom with Aaron by my side, ready to fight for our future. As the proceedings began, Clara tried to play the doting aunt, her words dripping with insincerity. Mark played the role of the repentant father, but his eyes were cold and calculating. But when Aaron spoke, his voice clear and unwavering, the truth shone through. I want to stay with my mom. She's been there for me when no one else was. The judge's decision came like a ray of sunlight through the clouds, full custody granted to me, with no visitation rights for Mark and Clara. As we left the courtroom, Mark's face was a mask of rage, and Clara's eyes burned with malice. But it didn't matter. We had won. Aaron and I, together. The victory in court brought a temporary sense of peace, but it was short-lived. Mark and Clara, like wounded animals, became more desperate and dangerous in their tactics. They started a slanderous campaign, spreading lies and rumors about me in our community. It was a psychological warfare I hadn't anticipated. One evening, Aaron came home from school, his eyes brimming with unshed tears. Mom, kids at school are saying you stole me from Dad, that you're keeping me away from him because you're mean. My heart broke at his words. Aaron, you know that's not true. Everything I've done, I've done to protect you and Elise. He nodded, but the doubt was evident in his eyes. I know, Mom, but it's hard. They don't understand. I hugged him, feeling his small body tremble. I know it's hard, sweetheart, but we'll get through this. We're stronger than their lies. As the days passed, the rumors grew more vicious. Clara had always been cunning with her words, and now she used them like a weapon to turn my world upside down. I knew I had to fight back, but I was wary of stooping to their level. Then, one day, Mark showed up at my workplace, a facade of remorse plastered on his face. Lauren, can't we just talk about this, for Aaron's sake? His words were like poison, and I could see through his act. There's nothing to talk about. You made your choice, Mark. Now live with it. He grabbed my arm, his grip tight. You're ruining my life, Lauren. You and that kid. I pulled away, my voice steady. No, Mark, you did that all by yourself. As I walked away, his parting words sent a chill down my spine. This isn't over, Lauren. I won't give up that easily. The legal victory had given me custody of Aaron, but it hadn't ended the war. Mark and Clara were relentless, and I could see the toll it was taking on Aaron. He was caught in the middle of a battle he didn't understand, torn between his biological father and the mother who had never left his side. One night, Aaron came to me, his face etched with conflict. Mom, what if Dad changes? What if he wants to be a real dad? His words hit me hard. Aaron, I know he's your dad, and it's normal to hope for that, but we have to see people for who they are, not who we want them to be. Aaron was silent for a moment, then looked up at me, his eyes clear. I know, I just wish things were different. I held him close, whispering, I do too, Aaron, I do too. Despite the ongoing battle, I had to ensure that Aaron and Elise remained my priority. They were my strength, the reason I fought so hard, and I would do anything to protect them, to give them the life they deserved, free from the shadows of Mark and Clara's deceit. The relentless campaign by Mark and Clara took a darker turn, evolving into outright harassment. They seemed to be everywhere, outside my workplace, near Aaron's school, always lurking, always watching. It was a psychological siege, and I felt its weight every day. But I refused to be intimidated. It was time to hit back, to make them realize they couldn't trample over our lives without consequences. I scheduled a meeting with Mr. Thompson, my resolve like iron. Mr. Thompson, it's time we take more aggressive legal action. 
I want to file for a restraining order against Mark and Clara, and I want to sue them for harassment and defamation, I declared. Mr. Thompson nodded in agreement. I think that's a wise decision, Lauren. Their behavior is unacceptable, and it's time they face the legal repercussions. The legal proceedings were grueling, but I stood firm. In court, Mark played the victim, a man wronged by his vindictive ex-wife. Clara, ever the actress, wept about being denied the chance to be a part of her nephew's life, but their performance couldn't mask the truth. The judge saw through their facade and granted the restraining order. Additionally, they were ordered to pay damages for their defamatory actions. As we left the courtroom, Mark's face was a mask of fury, while Clara's eyes burned with unspoken threats. But this time, I wasn't afraid. I had the law on my side. Their defeat in court, however, did little to quench their vendetta. If anything, it seemed to fuel their spite. One day, I received a chilling phone call from Mark. You think you've won, Lauren? You think you can just destroy my life and walk away? I'll make sure you regret this, he hissed through the phone. I clenched my jaw, fighting back the fear his words invoked. You brought this on yourself, Mark. I'm just protecting my family. You haven't seen the last of me, Lauren. This isn't over, he spat before hanging up. His threat hung in the air like a toxic cloud, but I wouldn't let it break me. I had Aaron and Elise to think about. They were my world, and I would go to any lengths to shield them from Mark and Clara's malice. But as days turned into weeks, the constant stress began to wear me down. The never-ending vigilance, the fear of what Mark might do next, the pressure of being a single mother, it was all-consuming. One evening, as I put Elise to bed, Aaron came to me, his expression somber. Mom, are we going to be okay? Dad sounded really mad on the phone. I pulled him into a hug, my heart aching for the worry he had to bear. We're going to be okay, Aaron. I won't let anything happen to us. I promise. But even as I spoke the words, I knew the battle was far from over. Mark and Clara were like a storm on the horizon, and I needed to be ready for whatever they threw our way. The weeks following the court ruling were a tense and watchful time. Mark and Clara, now bound by the restraining order, had receded into the shadows, but their silence was more unnerving than their threats. I knew this lull was just the calm before another storm. Then it happened. Clara, in a move of sheer desperation, orchestrated a public scene. I was picking up groceries when she appeared out of nowhere, screaming accusations, You're a monster, Lauren! You've torn our family apart! Clara wailed. Clara wailed, drawing the attention of bystanders, I stood my ground, my voice steady. Clara, you need to leave. You're violating the restraining order. Her face twisted in rage. I don't care. The world needs to see what kind of person you really are. But her theatrics backfired. The store manager, recognizing the disturbance, called the police. As they escorted a hysterical Clara away, her image of the wronged aunt crumbled. This public meltdown was the final straw. The police charged Clara with violating the restraining order and public disturbance. Mark, too, faced consequences. His involvement in the harassment and defamation, now fully exposed, led to his arrest. As I watched them being taken away, a part of me felt a pang of pity. They had descended into their own hell, a pit they had dug with their lies and hatred. But this feeling was quickly overshadowed by a sense of justice. They were finally facing the consequences of their actions. In the aftermath, the community's perception shifted. The truth about Mark and Clara's deceit and manipulation became apparent. People who had once whispered behind my back now offered their apologies and support. Aaron, witnessing the downfall of his father and aunt, had mixed emotions. Mom, is it wrong to feel happy about Dad and Aunt Clara getting arrested? I took his hand, understanding his inner turmoil. It's okay to feel relieved, Aaron. They hurt us a lot. It's okay to want justice for that. The battle that had consumed our lives for months finally seemed to be over. Mark and Clara, once towering figures of intimidation, were now diminished, their power to harm us stripped away. As I tucked Aaron and Elise into bed that night, a sense of peace settled over me. We had weathered the storm and emerged stronger. I knew there would be challenges ahead, but for the first time in a long while I felt hopeful about the future. With Mark and Clara's legal retribution, a heavy burden lifted from our shoulders. The days seemed brighter, and our home was filled with laughter once again. Aaron's smile returned, and Elise's innocent giggles were a balm to our scarred hearts. 
the community's support was overwhelming. Apologies turned into offers of help, and slowly the rumors and whispers faded away. We were rebuilding our lives. Piece by piece. But the true testament to our newfound peace came on my birthday. Aaron, now more mature and thoughtful, had a surprise for me. He approached with a shy smile, a small gift in his hand. Happy birthday, Mom. I made this at school for you, he said, handing me a beautifully crafted photo frame. It held a picture of the three of us, smiling and happy. Tears welled up in my eyes as I hugged him. Thank you, Aaron. This is the best gift I could ever ask for. Later that day, as we celebrated with a small party, our little family felt whole again. Friends and neighbors joined in, their presence a symbol of the life we had reclaimed. During the party, a new face appeared. It was Tom, a kind and understanding man I had met through my work. His support during our trials had been unwavering, and his presence now felt like a promise of new beginnings. Happy birthday, Lauren. I hope this year brings you all the happiness you deserve. Tom said, his eyes warm and sincere. I smiled, feeling a spark of something new, something hopeful. Thank you, Tom. It's already off to a great start. As the party wound down, Aaron came up to me, a serious look on his face. Mom, I've been thinking. Maybe it's okay to start new things, to be happy again. I knelt down to meet his gaze. It's more than okay, Aaron. We've been through a lot, and we deserve to be happy. He nodded, a small smile gracing his lips. I like Tom. He's nice. And I think he makes you happy. I hugged him, my heart full. He does, Aaron. And I'm glad you like him. That night, as I put Aaron and Elise to bed, I felt a sense of contentment I hadn't known in years. We had faced our demons and emerged victorious. Our future was ours to shape, and it looked bright and full of promise. Life had thrown us into turbulent waters, but we had learned to navigate the storm. Now it was time to enjoy the calm, to embrace the new dawn that awaited us.